years and those, those babies kill you. So, and you're supposed to get more tonight. Wow. Awesome. Okay. Well, not awesome for those of you that have to drive in it tomorrow. So I won't wish it, I won't wish it on you, but all right, you guys, welcome. Welcome. Let me um, share my screen and kick us off. We'll start, start talking about something besides um, <laughs> keto diet and, uh, and weather, which is where we were uh, chatting before the session began. So let me just adjust my Zoom windows real quick here and then put this up in present mode so you all can see it better. And we will walk through some ideas together this afternoon. So welcome again. My name is Avra Robinson, and I am an instructor with an organization called EdTech Teacher. And we are thrilled to partner with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed in Massachusetts, as well as Google, um, to bring, bring you these live and free webinars. So we've been doing this since last summer, and there are probably about 18 of them now that have been um, done over the last six months or so, and we have put them all on our YouTube channel. Um, because they're free, anybody can watch them, and you can watch them as many times as you'd like. So, um, so they're there, and I'll give you the link to that at the end um, of our session today. So I will also give you the link to these slides so that you have them. So if you want to just sit back and relax, um, you don't have to feel like you need to take notes or anything like that. I'm just going to walk through a bunch of ideas. While I do, though, you guys, I want you to know that the way that I run my sessions is very informal. Um, I know that we've got about um, 10 of you here, and I want you to feel really comfortable. I'm doing a quick mute all just because we had a little bit of background noise, but I want you to feel really comfortable unmuting at any time and sharing an idea or asking a question. You can definitely use the chat. I have the chat up on my other monitor, and so I'm going to be kind of keeping an eye on that as well. But if you've got something to share, you know, I, I really don't want this to be a one-way thing street. If you want to chime in, I would love it. So um, please feel free to do that. So I did hit record. We are ready to go. Um, we are here today to talk about creating digital learning environments for elementary kids. And I want you to know that I am a former um, third grade teacher and a former elementary um, instructional technology specialist. Um, I did a year in kindergarten. I did a year in third grade. I did 14, 15 years um, K through eight. And so my specialty is really working with little guys um, to help them understand technology and working with teachers to help them design technological um, environments and learning experiences that can be less, hopefully less confusing, less overwhelming for kids, for our little kids. So we're going to take a look at everything from some assistive technology possibilities on some Chromebooks um, to maybe some ideas for using audio and video, as well as just even some digital design tips and tricks, like how you might take a Google slide and make it so that kids can access it more easily, um, understand the information on it more easily. Okay, so let's start um, by just talking about, you know, when we use technology, elementary, we know that so much of our world is hands on, right, when we're in the elementary grades. And so does um, does the technology provide a functional improvement is the first question I have. So that's always something I ask teachers. Hey, listen, is this something that is going to somehow augment what you're already doing? And if not, you know, why, why use it, right? So in other words, why shouldn't we just do it on paper? So this is what I always ask folks. Um, first before they start using technology because why are we going to use technology you know for technology's sake right so exactly becky the SAMR model is the perfect you know perfect um example of that like let's find ways to um to utilize it and make things better and not just use it just to use it right so i always say to teachers the first thing that you should think about is you know does it provide that functional improvement and i'll give you some examples for what I consider to be a functional improvement, but really ask yourself, or if you're a tech specialist, maybe ask your teachers, you know, are your curricular or pedagogical objectives being met or, or being augmented by the use of this technology? But another really important thing to ask, especially with, with younger students, and, you know, maybe all the way up through, you know, sixth grade or so, um, 
will my students benefit from practicing with these tools? So when we think about the last couple of years of our lives, you know, how much did you wish a couple of years ago that you could just be with your kids when you were stuck away from them, right? And what do you wish that we had, oh God, I wish we had taught them this or that before this pandemic had hit us, before this remote learning had been thrust upon us. So things to kind of think about, you know, um, we want to look for ways that the technology can provide opportunities for growth and for autonomy, for independence, and audio and video can do that. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, looking for ways to possibly create some station rotations with audio or video instructions or content being built into those environments and into those activities um, to be able to help support students to kind of clone the teacher. So I'll talk to you more about that. Um, when we think about a really awesome use of technology, my thought would be to chronicle learning, right? So, so much happens in our classrooms, but you know what? Teachers, educators in general are pretty hard on themselves, I've found. Um, I've been teaching for about 25 years, and so I think I know teachers pretty well. I am one. And we, as a as a society of educators are very prone to say, I have so much to get through and I feel like I didn't get enough. I wish I had more time with my kids, right? I didn't get to this, I didn't get to that. And if you take the time to build in opportunities for kids to chronicle their learning, take a picture of something, do a quick video, create a digital portfolio, or just a quick learning log of some sort, and you can do that so easily with technology, then it, gets, it gives you a chance to kind of look at the growth over time that happens, look at this wonderful chronicle that you can create and just this body of work. And you can kind of go, all right, cool. You know what? I feel like it's a, a hamster wheel. I feel like I'm not getting enough done, but look at everything we actually have done. Right. And so we know that too, whenever kids are recording themselves, recording their thinking, um, that kind of a chronicle can also help you as a teacher take a look at where they're at, right? It's wonderful formative assessment, and it's a wonderful chance for you to inform your, your own decisions and your own choices moving forward. Not to mention, it's a great thing to show to parents. So these are reasons that, you know, I would use technology. And I think that even though during remote learning, we were in front of screens constantly. So we've kind of moved away from wanting to always be in front of a screen. There are some really great uses. And I think this is one of them. The other thing I think we need to really consider, and I said this a little bit ago, is the idea of giving kids the chance to practice skills, okay? And so I used to be a technology teacher. So I was the technology integration specialist, coach, coordinator for the, the district. And I did everything from keeping people's email running, which was very important, to also teaching their kids twice a week, taking every class and teaching them. That was also very important, right? And what was neat was the opportunity to work with kids on specific skills that then they could take back to their classroom and be able to utilize in the service of learning. So what's hard is that not all schools have a person like me. And in fact, my school doesn't have that anymore now that I've moved on, but you know, not everybody has that. And so sometimes that falls on the shoulders of the classroom teacher. And that can be hard because classroom teachers already do so much, but just like we need our kids to be able to hold a pencil, we need them to be able to navigate these digital environments. So we need to think about what those skills are and give them time, specific time to practice those skills. Not at a time when they're trying to learn a new content idea, Okay, not at a time when they're trying to learn a new skill in some other way with some other curricular area, but specific dedicated time when they can practice tech skills without additional pressures. So we'll talk more about that. So what I would say to you is when you're using technology in the classroom, you know, consider what your objective is, consider what your purpose is. One of the ways that I love to use it is to allow students to reflect, to allow them to pause before moving from one learning activity to the next, from one learning experience to the next, get them to stop and ask themselves not only what they learned, but why they learned it and maybe how they learned it. What strategies did they use? You know, and I'm, I come at life from a kindergarten perspective because that's kind of my lowest common denominator, having spent time there. So even asking little guys questions like, what made this easy for you? Or what made this hard for you? What, what worked? Why did you understand? Or why did you learn today? And they will not know the answers to these questions at first, but 
as we ask them and they get more and more used to answering these questions, their metacognitive skills really grow and their reflection, you know, deepens. And so it's an awesome opportunity. So using technology, we can, you know, we can have them type these answers, but really what I love is when we do something like use Screencastify and just let them create a two minute recording where they've got a Google doc open on their screen or a Google slideshow or a Google drawing or a website where they've just practiced math facts. And they just either turn on the front facing camera in Screencastify or record, if they don't want the front facing camera on, record their screen and talk about their experience. I just got a 10 out of 10 on extra math or on whatever, 10 marks or whatever they're doing, right? And you know why I think? Because I really focused or because I practiced with flashcards with mom last night or whatever it is, giving them that chance to pause and chronicle and, and reflect can be really powerful. And so that's an easy, an easy way to be able to start to create a chronicle, you know, teaming up Screencastify with maybe a Google slideshow and just having it become like a like a, a video journal or an audio journal where kids can just reflect as they're moving through their days and weeks. That can be a really powerful use of technology. Thinking about, you know, artwork or music. I mean, absolutely any curricular area you can reflect on, right? But, you know, kids having pictures or having the front facing camera going and them talking about the things that they're making or the things that they're practicing, they can talk about their progress or they can talk about a final product. Um, so they can talk about an experience. Basically, you know, a screencast is going to be any time that you're going to combine anything that's on the computer so like I said, you know, any kind of Google product, and this doesn't just have to be a slideshow or a doc, you guys, it could be a spreadsheet. If you've got older kids and they've done stuff in a spreadsheet or they've done something in a Google form, absolutely anything that's on your computer screen, right, can be recorded with Screencastify. And, you know, I, there's lots of different um, video recorders and there's lots of different screen recorders. This session is based on Google products, which is why I keep talking about Screencastify and the Google products. But, you know, if you were a Seesaw user, absolutely, you know, there's all sorts of those tools in there. And the other icon, Becky, is it this one here? Yeah, so that's just me saying your thoughts, right? That's just like a brain. <laughs> so it's not an, you were thinking that's a new app and Aubrey can show me a new app. Yeah, sorry, it's not. Um, but yeah, that's just my idea of like, hey, utilizing something that's happening on your computer record with Screencastify and talk about it and then create yourself a video. And then those videos get stored in Drive, guys, which then immediately can be you know, put into a Google site or into a Google slideshow and a chronicle can be born, okay? So you know, kids can also with Screencastify um, walk through a slideshow that they've created. So if they've created a slideshow about Martin Luther King, or maybe we're in Black History Month and we're doing some stuff there, or, you know, absolutely anything, kids can talk through their slides. I also found that besides creating a slideshow and like a narrated slideshow, I found that sometimes when kids were going to do presentations in the front of the class, I would have them practice first with a screen recorder. And why? Well, I don't know about you, and I don't know if any of you have ever presented at like a conference, but I've tried before to stand in front of the mirror and practice, and I can't make myself do it. I feel like a huge dork, and I know dork's not a very nice word, but I feel dorky, and so instead, I turn on Screencastify, and that way I can time myself, I can see how long I talk about stuff, and it's something about hitting record. All of a sudden, it's like you've got this accountability partner and it can you can see how long it takes you and you can see if there's something that you really don't understand how to explain because you're doing it right so i've had my kids use it to practice or to create presentations um and what's neat about it is that you're looking right at your slides like right now i'm looking at my screen and i'm talking to you but it'd be the same thing if i were you know doing it in screencastify and that way they get comfortable with their content have you ever had kids present in class with like a slideshow that they've created and they go up there and they stand and with their back to the whole, the whole class and they're looking at their slides and they're just reading their bullets, reading their bullets, you know, point by point. And you're like, oh, remember we talked about like making eye contact with your audience, speaking naturally, all of those kinds of things. Well, they get used to doing those things when they can practice a couple times. So think about that as a possibility as well. Okay. Um, when they're doing this, they're demonstrating their understanding. Okay. So they're taking anything that they've done and 
combining it to create a video. So things like, hey, can we just get a, a picture of a map on there? And maybe we're looking at cardinal directions or some other piece of you know, maps or any kind of diagram, science diagrams, social studies diagrams, math, you know, and then labeling it. So you guys, this is just a screenshot from Screencastify. And this is the drawing tools right in Screencastify. Super simple to use, right? Same idea with language. So you might have spent time on parts of speech and maybe you have kids take a reading passage, something that is you know, on their screen, and then they're gonna look for parts of speech, or maybe they're gonna look for the main idea and the supporting details, You know, whatever it is, it can be a lot of different things. But when they have to record something, when they have to talk through their ideas, they have to really know what they're talking about. And so it gives you as a teacher a chance really to understand what they understand, it's like a chance to sit down with them, you know, instead of, and we can't with every single kid, every single day, we, we can't maybe get that five minutes to just sit down and conference with every student, but having them create something like this does give that opportunity. So think about also utilizing the front facing camera in Screencastify. So combining something that's happening physically. So maybe they're holding up you know, their notebook and they're showing something that they made in an elementary classroom if they've worked with math manipulatives. Maybe they take the camera and they go like this, you know, where you can see the, my, my old table here, um, but you know, where you can see the table and you can see the blocks or you can see whatever the manipulatives are. And then they're talking through the concept. You know, I added the with these and this is what I got, that kind of thing. Maybe they're doing reading fluency, you know, so we've got an actual book that they're holding or an actual piece of paper with that reading fluency passage and then they're just using the front facing camera. All of those are possibilities, okay? And what's happening is that hopefully through this, we can start to make student thinking visible. We can get them demonstrating their skills and, and their understanding of content by verbalizing. And I'm not, I'm gonna tell you a secret, okay? And don't tell anybody I told you this. I know we're recording this, but that's okay. You don't have to watch all of every single one. Sometimes it's okay to let kids swap them with each other and watch each other's. Sometimes it's okay to watch part of one. I'm not saying that if you've got 30 kids that make three minute screencasts that you've got 90 minutes every night to watch every screencast. Sometimes it's just about them journaling, journaling through video or audio, okay, and creating something that mom and dad are going to look at, or someone else in their life, okay, yeah, gallery walks on their devices, Becky, exactly, thank you so much for chiming in, so you guys think about this, okay, I'm going to show you part of um, a screencast of a student, a second grade student who was working this math problem, okay, here's the math problem, you measured the perimeter of a triangle, it was 20 centimeters what could the side lengths be? So you guys, this is a screenshot of his final answer. As we look at this, what does this tell us? Well, he got it right, right? Seven plus five plus eight. My math isn't great, but I know that's 20, okay? So this tells us that, you know, he knows how to draw a triangle. He can write out his digits and he got the problem right, right? Well, now let's watch part of this. And I'm going to, I'm going to fast forward through all of it because it's, or through some of it, because it's about four minutes long and I don't want you, I don't want to take up too much of our time, but I want you to see how we really get a chance to understand his thinking. Okay. So let me hit play and you guys, somebody give me a thumbs up that you can hear it once it starts. So let's say this is the triangle. So you measured the perimeter of a triangle. It was 20 centimeters. What could the side lengths be? So let's just get this out of the way. So, so uh, five. Wait, that's too big. Let's say three times Five equals fifteen. And so that's not enough. Six. So I'm going to start to fast forward a little bit. You guys will see he does three, three times six. And he says, oh, nope, that's still not quite enough. And then he does seven plus seven plus seven. And that's 21. And he's like, well, but that's too much. Let me hit play again. Three times time. So three times six point five. Oh, I don't really know that one. 
but I know that it won't be enough. Oh, wait a sec. I found out a way. All triangles aren't the same. All, all sides of a triangle aren't the same length. They can all be different, like in the regular triangle. So, let's see, let's see what what numbers could equal. So say this is eight. So say this is seventeen. This one. Wait. Nah, that not. I don't think so. So let's say that this one is five. This one is seven. And let's see what it takes to get back to twenty. So that would be already that would already be twelve. So thirteen. And this one is gonna be eight. So so each so this one is eight. This one is seven, and this one is five. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, I love that. So, does anybody want to share in the chat? Like, what do we know now that we didn't know on the last slide? Right, like when we can just see the answer on paper. I have to tell you, my husband is a or was a um, middle school math teacher, and he spent a lot of time writing on those papers. Show your work. Right. So I had my daughter when she was in middle school got that a lot because I think her work maybe had was on somebody else's paper, to be completely honest. But what do we know the difference? Like, what's the difference here? Anybody want to share? You can see him working it out, like he's making mistakes and then learning from them. Yeah. Yeah, so we see a little bit about his character, right? Like his perseverance, character traits. We can, you know, start to understand his thought processes a little bit. Um, we can clearly listen to his thinking. Exactly, Karina. Yeah. So I think it's really cool. And like I said, you know, this is four minutes long. We're not going to watch every kid do every math problem, you know, every night. But there might be times, maybe, maybe it's a kind of a summative assessment at the end of um, a unit or a chapter or you know whatever it is. Um, lots and lots of possibilities. I think. So another idea here, guys, is that, like I said, you could have kids swap, right? So they could make screencasts for each other and then share them with one another. They can even, if they wanted to, they could make, they could open somebody else's slideshow and just be looking through it and giving feedback as they are, um, you know, as they're looking at it, they could be like, well, hey, I would change this slide and do it differently or that kind of thing. So I've seen you know, screencasts used in a lot of different ways. And my watch was buzzing at me, sorry. Um, so lots of possibilities. Another wonderful use of technology is digital storytelling. And, you know, we could do an entire session on digital storytelling, and I won't spend too much time on it now. But digital storytelling is very cross curricular, like it doesn't have to just be an ELA thing, it doesn't just have to be a social studies thing. Absolutely. You could retell parts of a story or make up a story or change the ending to a historical event and all of that. But in science class, we could retell the steps to a lab. We could walk through the steps to a math problem. You know, there's lots of different things that we can do when, we're, when we think about digital storytelling. So I've got some examples in here for you. You can take a look at this later if you want to. I'll click on it quickly. This is actually from an educator in Ohio. His name is Eric Kurtz. He's an amazing googly educator. If you don't already follow him, follow him on Twitter. He's amazing. Um, here is his little robot and penguin um, science concepts slideshow. So you guys, this is just a little comic strip that he's created. Each kind of um, block of the of the comic strip um, is just a slide, right? So, hey, Penguin, what are you doing? Just studying. And so why do you have a book on your head? You know, uh, well, it's for science class. So I thought osmosis might work, right? So, you know, this kind of thing can be a neat way for students to be able to show what they know, but do it in a fun and creative way, right? So keep that in mind um, and keep in mind that 
as though, although I've given a lot of different examples of things that are happening digitally, it shouldn't all be digital, right? We're gonna do things in the classroom that are hands-on and that kids are working with each other and we're face-to-face -face and we've got real, you know, paper and pencil and all of that. All of that can be captured with, you know, a quick photo, with a quick video, and then we can take it to the next level by allowing student voice to be, you know, recorded. So this picture was taken a long time ago, 2011 maybe or so, and I don't have this child's voice because the technology just wasn't as ubiquitous. It wasn't there then to be able to combine it. But now it's so it would have been so easy for him to for 30 seconds to tell us about his self right and how he used his pasta and his googly eyes and you know and and what the yarn is around it and all of that so thinking about those kinds of things can be really awesome additionally we've got opportunities for teachers to create learning environments for students okay so this could be done in a google slideshow this could be done in a hyperdoc like in a um an actual google doc okay and again this is a google session but you know you may use other learning management systems like canvas or seesaw other things like that so in general let's talk about some design choices and principles that we might want to use especially with younger learners now if you do work with older students Honestly, these same kinds of things are gonna be good for them as well. So to begin with, we wanna think about the ease of navigation and the number of clicks, okay? We want things, we want kids to be able to access documents and access environments easily and not be confused and, and bogged down by the number of clicks, okay? So thinking about that when you're creating things, but then additionally, looking for, supports that we can put in place beyond text. So right now, this is a terrible slide. If I were giving this to you to look at without me being here to explain it, it's black and white and it's got a whole lot of text on it, okay? And it only has one little image over here. If I were designing this, I would not design this for a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old, okay? I would be doing things like putting um, language. I'd be putting audio in there. I'd be putting video in there. I'd be using icons or images. Um, and I would, I always, always encourage teachers to put their teacher hat or their take, take their teacher hat off put their student hat on and look at this through the eyes of a child and try to figure out, you know, where the stumbling blocks are gonna be and what can we add to this to make it better. So to begin with, you know, graphics, guys, images, icons, there's a really great add-on in Google Slides that's called Insert Icons, okay? I'm just gonna show it to you real quick. If I go to Add-ons, it's just this one right here, Insert Icons, and you just open up this sidebar. And they can be any color you want. You can pick whatever color you want. You can do a search for them. So it opens up this panel over here on the side and you can pick the one that you're always going to use because we're going to talk about consistency next. The one that you're always going to use when it's time for the kids to type something or write something. The one you're always going to use when it's time for them to record, okay? So you might type in something like, um, let's see if this works. We'll see if mouse comes up. Okay, it did. So if you want to always, you know, when, when they need to click on something, um, you could always use the same mouse pointer icon, okay? And that way then if they're supposed to click right here, then maybe you take this and maybe I should have made it black, but you know, you take that and that points to something that in that way you train your kids, hey, when they see this, they should click on something, right? So that's just a way to find them. I also use Noun Project, okay? Um, noun Project is actually one of the few things that I pay for, but you don't have to, you know, you can absolutely get lots and lots of free icons. And what I would suggest is if you're going to be designing activities for students that are in, in this environment, pick, one that you like, right? So if this to you says, hey, this is a person reading, well, then you need to teach that to your kids because to some people, this might say person with the book out in front of them. To other people, they might look at that and have no idea what that is, right? So when we think about icons, we have to make sure that our kids understand icons, whether they are the icons up here across the top, right, of a, of a toolbar, do they know what those things mean? In any environment, do they know what those things mean in order to be successful? So you guys, I always tell the story of the first time that I got my mom for her birthday, an MP3 player. Okay. This is before iPods even. So just a plain old MP3 player. And I really thought that I was going to win for being the best birthday present giver that year. 
And while she loved the music aspect of it, she's not a TV watcher. So she wasn't used to a remote with lots of icons. So two lines to her did not mean pause. A square did not mean stop. She didn't know what those icons meant. Therefore, she couldn't run this device and she wanted to throw it against the wall, <laughs> okay? So our kids can be the same way. If they don't know what these, work, what these icons mean, they can't navigate this environment. So you're gonna wanna establish consistent icons that you're gonna use in your directions and then teach them to your kids, right? And talk about it. Hey guys, what does this look like to you? Yeah, it's a pencil and it's supposed to look like it's writing on a page. So whenever you see this, that means that there's gonna be something for you to type inside that box. Or if you see this, it means that it's time for you to get your notebook out and write something down. And then I might ask you to take a picture of what you wrote on paper and put it into our slideshow or so on and so forth, okay? So you have to think about what you want your kids to do and then look for ways utilizing something beyond just language because some, first of all, some of them are struggling readers. Some of them are early readers or pre-readers and everyone is going to be, is going to benefit from color and images combined with language. It'll help deepen understanding. Okay, so think about all of that and then think about consistency. So if you're gonna design an activity, and again, doesn't matter what environment you're in, okay? So I know many of you may be using Google Classroom and Google Tools, but some of you might be using other, other programs. But think about staying consistent with where you put your instructions, whether you make them bold, whether you make them red, you know, pick a color, pick a style, pick a location, because if you do that, then students don't have to spend so much time deciphering where to find the instructions, where can I have it read to me, you know, how, what, where do I click, is there a home button that takes me back, is there a back button that takes me just back one level, all of that kind of stuff. If you can pick, you know, specific consistent ways to put it out there, then they spend more time focused on what you want them to do and on the content and less trying to decipher the environment, okay? Does anybody have a question or a thought before I just kind of keep going. And I'm just going to look at what Karina had said. Um, you were talking about the video, even if he had gotten the wrong answer, it would inform the teacher about how to facilitate learning. Yeah, it was super cute. And thank you for your comment. I agree. Cause yeah, so much of the time, that whole idea of show your work is really so that the teacher can decipher like where, where a kid went wrong in the process, you know? So that's awesome. Anybody have a question or anything like that? All right. I'm going to keep going then. All right, what's next? Mistake tolerance. How many of you, be honest, when you were doing long division in fourth grade, wrote something and it was wrong and you erased so much that your paper crumpled and maybe even ripped? Anyone? It happened to me and I get so frustrated, right? This is the magic of technology. We can erase and delete and undo without some of the, the frustration of mistakes, okay? So this might be a reason to use technology over paper and pencil. And I think a combination of both is really important, but I'm just trying to like talk through some ideas here. So the undo button, the undo button lives in a lot of environments, okay? Again, if you're a Seesaw user, there's an undo button. You know, any of the Google products, there's an undo button, okay? Control Z, if you're on a Windows computer or a Chromebook or Command Z, okay, on your, on a MacBook is going to undo as well, all right, control Y or command Y then is going to be redo, and we'll talk about redo in a second, so this is going to undo the last thing they did, if they made a mistake, they can quickly undo it, okay, same thing for you guys, if you don't already use the undo button or control Z, it's my best friend, I do it all the time, and you could do it a bunch of times, and it's going to undo the, like, the last five things you did, so it can be fantastic, and then you know, the, the redo button, it's right next to it. So let's look at this. Um, yeah, it is total magic, isn't it? And isn't it wonderful? It's just so great for them. It's so freeing. So you guys, they're right up here, okay? In Google Slides, they're in the same, basically the same spot in Docs and us. I totally agree. I love undo. And frankly, when I'm doing something on paper and I can't do it, I get a little mad. I also get a little mad when I do this on a magazine and can't zoom in on the picture. But that may also be because I'm 47 and need readers and I'm not willing to buy them. So undo, redo, 
and the eraser tool. If you've got any kind of drawing program going on, and again, I keep mentioning Seesaw, but like in case people use Seesaw, but if you use Jamboard, okay, or Screencastify, anytime you've got drawing, any basically anytime you can ink on the screen, usually the program's got an eraser tool. It's really important though, for kids to understand what the eraser tool looks like. So you guys, without this word here, okay, this is the eraser tool in Jamboard. When I rest my mouse on it, the word erase pops up. That in and of itself is something to take the time to teach to kids. If you aren't sure what this thing is, cause yeah, I can see it now. It kind of looks like an eraser, but it's not pink. At least Screencastify made theirs pink, right? So this may or may not look like an eraser tool. Do kids know that if they rest their mouse on top of an icon that they're not sure what it is, it's gonna pop up and tell them. And if our little guys can't read, we need to teach them you know, how to find that eraser tool. Also, sometimes you're gonna have something like Jamboard does where you can clear the entire frame. That's highly important as well. If they don't wanna just erase one small part of something, they just wanna get rid of everything and start over fresh. This is the mistake tolerance that um, technology can provide, you know, and it can be so freeing for us. So thinking about that and then thinking about also they're creating any kind of video. You know, I've been talking about Screencastify a lot, knowing how to delete it. So once it's already done and you've finished, you can always go to the delete button in Screencastify, but almost even better, you guys, I don't know if any of you've done this when you use Screencastify, but if you click on the little arrow up in the extension bar and you drop down this menu while you're recording, this button is right here. How many of you have ever started a screencast and said something ridiculous or sneezed halfway through it or just sounded like a dork, sorry again to use that word, and wanted to just start over? Has anybody ever started one over again? I've done it 17 times before because somehow the stuff that's in my brain doesn't come out of my mouth quite right, right? So hitting that just starts it over for you. You don't even have to delete and start over. It just starts the whole thing over for you. Really good thing for kids to know as well. Really good for them to know that if they get halfway through and feel self-conscious, they can start over, okay? So that's the glory. That's the magic, I think, of mistake tolerance. So let's talk about now the chance for kids to, you know, time to practice these skills. Absolutely, any time that they can practice it authentically while they're working on content, while they're working on skills and, and learning things in the classroom and doing activities that their teachers have designed for them can be great. But sometimes the cognitive load can be too heavy. So sometimes it can be really important to give kids time to learn a new app. You know, if it's the first time that they're making a video in Screencastify, let them make it on something that doesn't have a heavy cognitive load. Don't be talking about, you know, the, the two-step equation or the, you know, the Black History Month concepts or article that we just read or something like that. Just let it be a quick all about me or a quick, here's three things that are fun about what I did yesterday in school or here's something I did last night. You know, just anything to practice um, without that heavy content load as well, okay? Giving them time to grow. Um, you know, and this is, you guys, this is a smattering. This is just me brainstorming, but what are the kinds of skills that our kids need? And thinking about identifying these and then trying to weave them into your practice is going to be really important. I hate to even say this out loud, but it's possible a pandemic could happen again. It's possible we could end up in remote learning again. Some of you may still be dealing with it, right? So what is the kind of stuff that we in April of 2020 wished our kids could do? We wished we could be there with them. I was teaching teachers at the time and I wished that I could teach some of them to right click because then they would know how to find a context menu or whatever it is, right? So, hey, what are all these things? Can they, do they know how to take a picture? Do you guys know how? Did you know you can take a picture right here in Google Slides? We can go insert, image, and we can go camera. We can take a picture of Avra's smiling face or we can take a picture of Avra's paper. Okay, so then we're just gonna hit this button and look, now we can hit insert and boom, we've got a picture of something we did on, you know, we, that we did on paper. Do you know how many kids and even teachers didn't know that in April of 2020? Are you serious? Did I teach you something new? Score, it's the best thing ever. It's also in Google Drawings, okay? It's so great. It's so integrated and it's so easy. So, you know, 
but so many people didn't don't know it. So taking the time to like come up with a list of the stuff, like, hey, you know, just even going back to like Google Meet or Zoom in case, just in case, right? Or maybe we're like, you know what, we're good there. We probably don't need to go back into like trying to, you know, learn Google Meet or Zoom, but, you know, knowing how to take a digital picture, knowing how to type in the chat of any kind of environment. Um, uh, the one thing when my son was in remote learning last year, I told, I, I put the dictation tool onto his Chromebook and I taught him to use it. And it's how he existed in that digital environment. So like he literally would hit the dictation tool. I'll show it to you guys in a minute on his Chromebook and say, may I please go to the restroom? And that, that typed into the Zoom chat so that that way he could, you know, ask his teacher a question without having to type it out. Because if he had, if my Cameron had to spend the time to type out, may I please use the restroom, he probably wouldn't make it, okay? Because it's hard. They don't have the typing skills necessarily. So thinking about giving our kids time to practice can be really important. Just giving them that time. Um, thinking about our digital tools as, you know, the pencils and paper and scissors and things like that all of it, they're all tools that they're gonna use in the classroom. So they need time to practice with all of them, okay? Um, so let's talk about some of the assistive technology tools and strategies. You guys, I, I mainly focused here because this is a Google session on Chromebooks, but if you need help with iPads, I have a lot of similar tools on the iPad. You can email me and I've got um, videos that I can show you or slideshows I can send you, okay, if you're iPad users, but dictation tool on Chromebook, okay? You're gonna go to the accessibility and you can turn this on. And when you do, it's just this microphone and in any environment, okay? Not just Google Docs, which I'll talk about voice typing in Google Docs in a minute too, but in any environment, you know, everything from, you could do a Google search or you can type in the chat of a, a video call or you can be in a seesaw, you know, environment. You can be anywhere and um, it, you click on it, it makes a soft chirp and you can start to talk. Okay, and and it will it will just transcribe that what you're saying. Now I'll tell you that when I was doing this with Cam, there was a huge learning curve. Like he rattled off a bunch of stuff, and he was talking like kids talk. They kind of talk in cursive, right? And we learn as adults. Any of you that have ever texted on your phone this way, learn quickly that we have to speak clearly and say things and enunciate in order for the technology to hear us correctly and put the correct words down. Otherwise it can become very frustrating. Kids will learn that too. And these are life skills, you know, for the rest of their lives, they're going to have technology tools that can do these things. I was working with my, one of my best friends from high school and we were talking about some assistive technology tools for her daughter. And she said, Avra, I'm not sure I wanna put all this in place for her because I'm not sure I want her to always have these things to fall back on. And I said, Kim, these are never going away. This is not like some kind of technology that's here now. It's just going to get better. So, you know, you really can feel free to allow kids to be supported by these tools because I really feel that they're not going away and they're just going to get better. So them being able to speak in, but then also the reverse of that is the Chromebook does have select to speak, right? Text to speech. So yes, Deb, this will be on um, YouTube. You're welcome. The, in the description, there'll be a link to the slides as well. Okay. So by tomorrow, it'll be up on our YouTube channel, Ed Tech Teacher's YouTube channel. My email address is avra at edtechteacher. If for some reason you can't find it, just hit me up and I will send you links. Okay. I'm going to just throw my email address right into the chat in case anybody else wants it talking and typing at the same time. So you guys, this is another accessibility thing that is built right into the Chromebook, okay? So this is gonna work in a lot of environments in, you know, in even in Google Docs and some, some PDFs and things like that too. So looking for this in your accessibility is, um, is gonna be really powerful for kids as well, okay? Um, for those of you that are using Google Classroom, and it actually doesn't matter what LMS you might use, consider audio or video or both for instructions, okay? So you put together an assignment, take the time to explain that which you've written out and talk to them too. Exactly, exactly, UDL, baby. I am with you, Becky, because I'll tell you what, I do better when I can hear someone explain things to me and I'm 47 and have a master's degree, okay? So it doesn't mean that our kids aren't focused. It doesn't mean that they're, you know, yes, we want them to be able to read, but we want them to be able to succeed. So if they're gonna succeed better by hearing the words and listening to their teacher explain, if your ultimate goal is that you want your students to succeed and learn, 
then we need to allow them to have these supports. Okay. So this is a wonderful support, even with, you know, yeah, with pre-readers or struggling readers all the way through the grade levels. It's so, so important for teachers to consider this. Okay. Would you ever walk into your classroom in any grade level and it had, hand your kids a, a sheet of paper that's an assignment, a worksheet of some sort, and then silently go and sit at your desk? and just expect them to read those instructions and do what they're supposed to do. No, right? You walk in, you do a lesson, you talk to them. Hey guys, on this piece of paper, here's what you're gonna do. It's a Venn diagram. So you're gonna need to put this on this side and this on this side and in the middle is gonna be this, blah, blah, blah. You explain it to them. Do it in digital environments as well, okay? Take a few minutes and do it. If you don't know how to do it, let me know. Online voice recorder is one way to do it. There's a program called Moat. It's paid now. I don't like to talk about it a whole lot, but lots of possibilities. And I've got those built into this presentation as well. Okay. Um, guys, there are some additional wonderful Chrome extensions. Okay. For your Chromebooks. If you want to take a paragraph that looks like this and have it read to students and have it be better spaced out better for them and have the ability to be, have it read to them, use something called the immersive reader Chrome extension. If you haven't ever seen this before, it is probably the most powerful extension um, that I can think of for elementary, okay? Here's what you do. You find a passage of text. So your kids will have to learn to highlight a passage of text and then right click on it. See how those practicing those skills comes in? It's so important, right? So once we highlight, we can highlight a, a passage of text by clicking and dragging, which is a hard thing to do, okay, on any device. So that's something we need to practice, or we can triple click one, two, three, one, two, three, not one, two, three, but one, two, three, right? We could triple click and that's going to do the entire passage. Then we're going to right click on the Chromebook. A right click is a two finger tap. Okay. So then we're going to go down to where it says, help me read this and watch what we're going to get with this immersive reader extension. It's beautiful. We get this environment. It's got lots of white space. It's got the words spaced out so kids can eat it, re read it more easily. And it's got a play button at the bottom. A herd of antelope moves slowly through the tall grass. If that's too fast, there's a settings button right here. We can move that down. We can make the voice male. Grass. Suddenly a cheetah leaps from its hiding place and the animal. So you can see the magic, right? Pretty awesome. Additionally, there are icons across the top right. If you choose the A, this is where you can decide the size of the text. Teach your kids to do this. Teach them to find the size that's comfortable for them. Teach them that they can increase or decrease the spacing of words. Our struggling readers are gonna do better with white space, white space between lines as well as between words. They can also choose which font they use. Our kids that suffer from dyslexia are going to do better with Calibri than they are with Sitka because Sitka is a, is a serif font. Serif fonts mean that there's little curly cues and tails on all of these. So there's all these little tails that makes it difficult for those students to read. So this environment is completely um, customizable by the user. Okay. And so... <laughs> Yeah, when you when I forget my glasses, I, I definitely I zoom in all the time. So you can change this, okay? Oh, my computer has stopped working. Let me see if this will. I'm clicking and nothing's happening. Isn't that fun? Uh, okay, I can hear the fan is running. My computer gets mad at me from time to time when I'm on a Zoom call um, because I have too many tabs open, not in this window, but in others. Um, so you guys, there's that. There's also grammar stuff in the middle. You can have turn on different parts of speech and have it color in different parts of speech, which is pretty awesome. Sometimes reading specialists look at that and love it. Yes, I need one tab, Becky, you're right. And then, um, and then the third one over you guys is reading preferences. So you can turn on something called line focus. And then when it's read, a herd of antelope moves slowly through the tall grass. It's got this line focus, which can be awesome. And then the last thing I'll show you is that you can translate a document as well. Okay, so you can translate a single word or you can translate the entire document in, and it will real time then transfer over everything to the different language. I'll turn off the line focus and then read it in that language. Un troupeau d'antilopes se déplace lentement à travers... So you can see tons and tons of possibilities there. Okay, great way to support kids. You have to can I yeah. can I just say, oh my God, thank you. I had no idea it did this. We have a kid who speaks only Portuguese. We have been racking our brains trying to figure out what to do for this kid. 
I had, we have this extension. I had no idea it did that. Oh, wow. Good. That's awesome. Oh yeah. It's the best. It's, it, it's the best translator. And it's a, so it's a Microsoft tool. You guys, this one is called like immersive reader, like unofficial or something it's called. So it wasn't made by Microsoft, but if you, if any of you use any Microsoft tools, you're going to find it in PowerPoint. You're going to find it in Word. You're going to find it in OneNote. You're going to find it in all those environments as well. You're also going to find it in Flipgrid. So, because Flipgrid is owned by Microsoft. So, um, yeah, it's, oh, was it, the, Nicole, do you mean the extension was made by a Microsoft developer? Because that's interesting. I didn't know that. It actually um, says Microsoft down in the right-hand corner of mine. Oh, okay. Awesome. I, this one, it's always said like unofficial, but now it's use immersive reader on websites. It used to say unofficial, like in the name of it. So awesome. Okay. Good to know. Well, this is where, you know, their, um, oh, it was his genius product that, project. That's awesome. Yeah. It's the best. It's one of the best extensions. I just absolutely love it. So I always want to make sure to get through it. And you guys, speaking of getting through, I'm not going to get through everything. I plan my sessions kind of like I planned my sub plans, always making sure to have too much. So forgive me. Um, I will, you know, share the slides with you um, as we finish up because I know we're down to about eight minutes. But the next extension that I would consider using is um, called the Mercury Reader. So what it's going to do is it's going to take that same paragraph and um, and make it so that it gets rid of all of the stuff. Okay, so this is what it looks like. And it, I bet I closed out of that, didn't I? Right click, reopen, close tab. Um, it's going to get rid of the menus and the ads and all the stuff that distracts not only our kids, but some of us as well. So what you do is you go up and click on the um, rocket ship right here, and it's just going to clear the page. And so this is also really wonderful if you've got like um, you know, a whiteboard and you're doing a whole group lesson and you want to just get rid of the, you know, the dancing ads and things like that, that your kids are going to focus on instead of focusing on the content. Um, this also has a little settings gear up here, top right. And it's going to have some of those same kinds of options in terms of changing the size and the type of the font, as well as like a dark background versus a light background. So these are tools that it's kind of like when I read um, here, like for example, I've been reading in this Kindle app on my MacBook. And, you know, I've learned that I can highlight certain sections and I can annotate and things like that. I can make things larger and smaller. It's about teaching kids that in these digital environments, there are supports built in, you know, so I, like I said, I can't do this when I'm reading an actual book. I have to actually go get, you know, readers and try to, you know, not get a headache, but, you know, in these environments, if we're asking them to interact and read and write and things like that, building in the tools for them so that that way they can be successful is gonna be a key. And then talking to them about how different environments are gonna have these different tools and that, you know, starting to learn what those icons mean and things like that will help them, okay? So let me zoom through just a couple more slides. And then this is more information about the Mercury Reader. This is information about the mouse cursor, guys. This is another thing that you can do on Chromebooks if your kids need it, okay? So if you've got little kids that lose where their mouse is or, or somebody with a visual impairment, my mom only sees out of one eye, so she loses her mouse on the screen all the time. So I went through and made her mouse larger, okay? You can do that on Chromebooks as well. You can also put an on-screen keyboard onto the um, Chromebook. So with the on-screen keyboard, not only would it help maybe some students that aren't going to do as well with the regular keyboard, but there's additional things like there's a draw to type. So there's a little squiggly line where I can, you know, do this and make an A and then it's going to type an A for me. It's also going to give me the possibility of an emoji keyboard and the dictation tool. And then it also can be made small and put in the bottom right corner. Okay, so lots of possibilities with that. So what I've been kind of alluding to this entire time is this idea of differentiation and voice and choice, right? So this is more UDL stuff, Becky, like it's, you know, it's really about empowering kids to make their own choices and set up their learning environment in ways that make sense for them. Because when we provide chances for voice and choice, it helps kids. It reduces their anxiety because they feel in control. So it motivates them. It can help focus them and keep their interest and their self-regulation in place. It can help make learning feel manageable for kids. Now, in order for it to feel manageable for teachers, what you have to remember is that you as a teacher are still in control. You decide the must do's, but then you allow kids choice whenever possible. So maybe you let them choose when or in what order or how they're gonna do something, right? So thinking about that. So what kinds of things do I mean? Like, what can we offer them? Well, with technology, 
we can do lots of things like the dictation tool, like select to speak, like voice typing in Google Docs, right? So for those of you, just in case there's anybody that's not familiar with this, um, Docs just in their tools menu has a voice typing feature, okay? So without even having, if I've shown stuff on Chromebooks and your kids don't use Chromebooks and you're thinking, well, that doesn't help me. Well, then in Docs tools, down to voice typing and we get this little guy all right so this little icon here or this little drop down menu floating menu floating whatever is going to be a microphone that i can click on and at this point i can speak and it will dictate what i say period now when i was doing this with cameron comma he made a lot of mistakes period we had to go back through and fix those mistakes period it was a learning opportunity but it took time period Okay, so you can see what it does. So that's a wonderful tool, especially for kiddos that can't type yet. Because, you know, a lot of times they have a lot of ideas in their head and the physical act of writing or typing is going to make it so that there's a barrier to them expressing themselves. If you want to know what Cameron knows, you've got to talk to him. Because if you ask him to put it into writing, you're going to learn that his writing skills are not nearly where his comprehension and his verbal skills are, okay? So if you truly wanna know what he understands about a subject, you've gotta let him either voice type or you've gotta let him talk to you or record his voice or something like that. And there's a lot of kids out there like Cameron. So you guys, I've got some other stuff in here. Sample, a sample to-do list. There's a wonderful check mark feature now in Google Docs. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but just know that it's here. Um, it's right here, all right? It's wonderful. You can make a list of things. Okay. This could be a list of assignments that kids need to do. And when they've done them, they can click on them and then look, they get a check mark and it'll just draw a line right through. So this is kind of life skills kind of stuff that I think would be really beneficial to kids. So we're down to two minutes. And so I haven't even gotten to all of the stuff I wanted to get to with audio and video. I may have to do a whole separate session on it and I will, but take a look at the slides and think about ways that you can incorporate audio and video into these environments. Um, you guys, it's going to be a way for you to clone yourself, okay? It's going to be a way for you to provide supports for students even when you can't be there. So think about station rotation and think about taking that which you would explain normally and just recording yourself doing it and then putting a Chromebook at a station. So even if you're not one-to-one, -one, you could have a Chromebook at a table and kids could rotate around once they're allowed to do that with COVID restrictions and all of that and be able to see you explaining, hear you explaining, okay? So it could look something like this, where you're back in the back of the room at your table with a certain group of kids working on a teacher-led activity and kids are still able to do other teacher-led activities because you've taken the time to record yourself, okay? And you've taken um, that, you know, that video then and put it there as a support for students at that station, okay? Now, if you've never created videos, a lot of people started creating videos during the pandemic, but if you haven't and you're nervous about doing so, just keep a couple things in mind and then I'm gonna be done, okay? They don't have to be perfect. They can just be you talking, okay? They need to be under three minutes, five at the most, especially if you're in the elementary classroom. They need to be short and sweet, okay? They need to have mistakes in them. So dork out, all right? Be yourself, be funny. If you sneeze halfway through, don't start over. Do as I say, not as I do, okay? Because sometimes I'm not good at doing this either, but trust your instincts as a teacher and just be yourself when you make a video. And remember that when you teach, you chunk information down for kids and you wanna do it in your videos too. So look through some of this guys. I've even got a link in one of these um, to an article that I wrote for Edutopia about um, my teaching students how to learn from video, okay? There's some ideas in there for you that you can, um, you can explore. Um, so I'm done. If you need to go right now, I want to be respectful of your time. This is supposed to end at 430. But if anybody wants to hang out and do a quick reflection with me, that'd be great. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate your feedback. Um, if you need to go, go. I'm going to throw the link to the slides into the chat right now in case anybody needs to go. But if anybody wants to do a quick reflection, tell me um, you know, what, you, what you picked up on, what you enjoyed learning, what resonated with you, a question that you might have, or you can even go through the thinking routine. I used to think, but now I think. <coughs> Excuse me.
I'm just so excited about that um, of reader. extension. I can't, I, that, oh, I that is so awesome. Uh, that, yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, I thought it was just a, a, like a read write type thing. And yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm so going to be the hero in our <laughs> district. Yeah. My only concern is, I don't know if it works in a Google Doc. So you might have to, like information for him, you might have to put it somewhere else. Well, we could always post it on my website. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking yeah. site or something like that. Yeah, because then yeah. it'll be then it's on the web and then it'll work. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, yeah. that's awesome. I mean, that's there's so many workarounds. You know, you can always work something out once you find the tool. It's just finding the tool because we have Microsoft, but I don't know why it 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 does not have the instant um, translation turned on. Okay. So for some reason, I don't wow. know why cannot find it and um it's unbelievable i've never seen like i've never seen the translate happen so seamlessly it's beautiful oh no i just tried it on a, a cnn article and it is awesome good and and i also i'm loving how um and it, this is also for the same kids it's like a whole family moved in and they speak uh portuguese sure and they don't really even read the language their own language very well Sure. So when they're learning, but it's got all the parts of speech that you can turn on the labels and yeah, I know I was re I was listening oh to a God. podcast. I was listening to a podcast on the ESL stuff and like the m common misconceptions with ESL, and that is that that kids are able to read and write in their own their, the, in their first language in their native right. language. That's not always the case. So that right. that was really interesting to me as well. So yeah, no, yeah. that's awesome. Like, good. Really awesome. Okay, good, awesome. Yeah. All right, and Karina, thank you for your for your participation and for your video being on. I appreciate you being here, um, and thanks for the feedback. I'm glad that you, yeah, that you got some ideas. That's awesome. Yeah, I I I really appreciate that. I'm from Brazil. I'm kind of an intruder here. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, I wasn't actually supposed to be here, but I asked people from MIT. I was in a in a, in some maker sessions with them. And I was like, oh, I really want to take part of, uh, on it. And they were like, go for it. You can do it. So really appreciate that. Yes. I'm on, on the way of implementing some um, STEM um, program in my school. So I'm on everything I can right now. So thank you so much. If you like this one, you should join their YouTube channel, subscribe yeah. to it, and watch all the videos because this has been a whole series that Desi did. And um, all yeah. the videos are up and they're I'll, all good. I'll put the link in the chat right now and that way you've got it. Um, got it already. There you go. Subscribed. So yeah, there are, <laughs> yeah, there are 18 of them up there and there's a lot, there's a lot of information. So yeah, and you can always email and follow up with questions. If there's anything we can do to support you, we'd love that. Thank so. you so much. Yeah, you're Thank welcome. you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. All well, right. Good, right. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Bye-bye. Yes. One, one thing I would like, please, is if you could go over that um it, that section with the dictation sure the um tell me more the dictation on the chromebook uh well i don't have a chromebook i google use docs. um google docs oh just the google docs this the google the, the voice typing this one here it, i use google suite great so what you do to use this is just go up um in google docs you want to go to the tools menu and down about two thirds of the way down, you'll see something called voice typing. And what you do is you click on it and then this little kind of floating toolbar appears right here and it becomes um, like a microphone tool that you can, you can click on. And when you do, then um, it activates the microphone and then it transcribes that which you say. So when you click on it, then you can speak and it will type what you're saying, period. And it'll even do some punctuation and things like that. So that that way then students can just speak in and um, and have their, their words kind of transcribed for them. Is that helpful? Yes, that was helpful, thank you. I think um, students who don't like to type, sorry, students who, yeah, students who don't like to type, I'll try and introduce this to them to see if it would improve them in submitting work. Absolutely. 
Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've had great success with it. Um, and a lot of times students have a lot of ideas in their head and, and because they type so slowly, they don't want to share them. You know, they take ideas that are very robust and they, and their sentence structure is very unsophisticated and their language, you know, they pick a different vocabulary word that they're able to spell or that's shorter to type and, and we lose, you know, that which they would say. So I've had a lot of success with it with students. I think it's a great tool. So that's great. All right. Well, I am going to end our time together. Thank you so much for, um, for hanging out with me today. You guys, I appreciate it. Stay warm. I hope you don't get more snow. We just got our school canceled for tomorrow. Oh my gosh, you're supposed to get that much again. Oh wow. Well, at least it's Friday. Yeah, long weekend. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So does that mean remote or does that mean just a true No, school? they haven't. Massachusetts is pretty much of a stickler of wanting the in person. So it means extra long into the summer. Yeah. 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 Well, hey, Jesse. we yeah. love Jesse. <laughs> well, you will be, um, you know what? Everybody's happier in May and June. And, yep. and so it'll be nicer out and at least take, you know, take the day and just, it's, it's, it's a sign from the universe that you need to relax. So, Hey, I'll take go. it. All right. <laughs> Have a good night. Go drive. Thank home. you again. Yeah. Get yeah. home before the snow. Yeah. I'll, I'll be in touch, Becky. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.